Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast, episode 794. This is being recorded on October 9, 2024. I'm Sebastian Peak. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Brett Van Spurberg. And despite the uncanny resemblance, I am not Qui-Gon Jen. I'm Kent Burgess. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the viewers of last week's He's video version of the podcast, eh, when yeah. I was referring to Kent's absence, I had a picture of Qui-Gon. And to me, like, when I see him, I just, I see Qui-Gon. Maybe it's just the Star Wars nerd in me, but I'm like, it's nah. it's the beard. You it's will not. subscribe to our Patreon. <laughs> Hey, no, I you gotta, won't. You gotta wait. <laughs> <laughs> what, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like this? <laughs> you can support PC Per at patreon.com slash PCPER. That's how you spell it. And you can be like, I don't even know. Uh, I'll let you pronounce these names, Brett, because you're the one who picked hey, them. Hey, hey, that's great. That's uh, appreciate that. So uh, new um, member, subscriber. Um, person who is putting a little money in the kitty so that this can continue is P. Charles Rusen. P. Charles Rusen. How'd I do? Charles Rusen? Yep, tell me. Plus, longtime members J. Hubbard, D. Llama, and I think another one of my favorite names, Swing Cat. I like that dude's name. You yeah, Swing Cat by Tail? Yeah. Mm. Just might. Mm. Or perhaps. Well, we won't go there. Josh, are you ready? Yep. Are you ready, I'm ready for the most no. important segment of it the is. week? No. no. The sore on my lip does not... Uh, what, what is the thing in Dune? The, the, the stain on my lip means my mind is in motion. The juice of Safu means my mind is turning it. No. No, yeah, this was... I, I had a cold. And then I got a cold sore. And now it's... It's just a, but let's go back to the juice of Sefu. Sure. I just took some before and yeah, my mind is definitely in motion. And because my mind is in motion, I, I need energy, need energy, need fat, need sugars. And uh, for that, I need to consume things and consume. I did because today was the cowboy Joe. I know that I have experienced this before, but they didn't wrap it up in one of those aluminum, you know, uh, metal foil things. So it came like this in the box. It was oh, nicely presented. Boy. So here you've got two onion smash patties, candied jalapenos, American cheese, hickory smoked bacon, and a house tangy mustard sauce. So two perfectly uh, seared uh, patties. Uh, the, the, the buns were toasted. Just how I like them. The candied jalapenos had a good bit of heat to them. You know, some of the jalapenos you get, you open them up and you taste them, and it's like it has no heat whatsoever. These were, these were nice. They were pleasant. So everything in that juicy, caramelized meat, candied jalapeno mustard sauce with good fries it was fantastic. And again. As you all well know, I am not going to eat for another 24 hours after that. It was a lot of burger. Josh. I'm getting old, you, you know. Have, you should have called for the PC per makeup artist to come in and, and fix that for you, by the way. Right. That adds character. Yeah. Okay. Our top <laughs> story this week has to be the Intel Core Ultra processors and this segment is absolutely not just being tacked on to the end after we went uh if we took the it's live totally show organic. those who might say that yeah liars it's it's not 12 liars. 13 a.m look, as look, we record look this. how similar my my lip is to the, 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 the current See, recording it proves it that's right we did this on the same, glass, look i'm wearing the same jacket my glass, watermark. my glass is full Oh, okay. Wait a minute. That, that could be your last like... glass, though, before you refilled. <laughs> anyway, so the Core Ultra processors are here. The 200S series, Arrow Lake S. Now, what did they what did they have as a goal? This is based on the, the mobile architecture, Lunar Lake. So we have the desktop version of it. And their 
goal was performance per watt, which sounds an awful mm. lot to me like this is a mobile first architecture like Haswell was way back in the day, for example, maybe more like Broadwell. No, anyway, uh, it's, it's going to have better multi-threaded performance. It says 15% generational multi-threaded performance increase while maintaining gaming performance. It doesn't say gaming leadership. It says performance. They, they were out to reduce package power by 40%. That's the, that's the first thing they list. And dropping by 10 C is not bad either. Uh, could be helpful. Uh, now, what's it? You said 24 cores. What is the e-core count on this? Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm just, I'm trying to okay. figure out exactly where they're talking about highest multi-threaded performance up to 24 cores for industry leading compute throughput on desktop PCs. Footnote one. Okay. Let's read that. As of, As of October, October 2024, among desktop processors targeting 125 watt TDP. That's a fairly so, narrow. Plus or minus yeah. 100%. So take away all of the Ryzen 9s. Because you they can only, only deal target with... 105. Mm-hmm. Well, no, the Ryzen 9s are at what? Like oh, sorry. One... Uh, yes, yes. 170. 170, 180. Here's a complicated chart here. A whole bunch Versus of information. Grace oh, of course, AI based is in there. Well, yes, because they're using the mobile architecture, they have yes. the same NPU. So, 36 megs of uh, shared cache. That's not It's not bad. Horrible. Yeah. Bringing the level three cache to Skymont. Three okay. megabytes per individual P core. That's up from two. And four per E. In Raptor Lake R. Okay. Four, four in the E-Core clusters is the same e as Raptor cluster. Lake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. That makes significantly yeah. more sense. Because they're, they're sharing L3. Yeah. The P and E-Cores yeah. have a shared L3, and then there's the L2 is... Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, of course, the, the big advancements to XE that we talked about with the mobile launch are there. So these are more capable in situations without a, a dedicated graphics uh, card. There's that uh, NPU. Lots of AI for stuff. For the enthusiast. Mm, and the so, GPU, of course. There's a filler tile here next to the IO tile. Interesting. Well, only Kent's going to see that, though. Right, he right. Because right. t- this thing up here, this thing called an IHS, that's an optional <laughs> HS. Okay, well, Kent, Kent, the filler yes. tile, it, it, it is going to improve thermals. Will it? So, Yeah, because everything will yes. be the same level. It's going to, yeah. Josh, I'm glad you brought up thermals because to me, when you have a, a you know a tiled architecture like this, don't you have a little bit? Isn't it kind of the same thing as like the stacking we got with AMD, where you had to go with a lower TDP because you just didn't have the thermal headroom no, to not, push? Not in this case because they don't have a compute tile that has a cache tile on top of it. It's all no. on one plane, but the filler tile does. I mean, because you've got the base tile, right? That's all the interconnects. That's going to heat up. Have a filler mm-hmm. tile that is going to connect the base tile to the heat spreader. Oh, okay. So, so it's, it's like a, it's, a direct It's not path. going to be air gapped. There's oh, okay. no, no I mean, air gap. That's, I'm no that's Stradamus. Clearly, I'm no Stradamus with air <laughs> gap. Remember that. The, uh, SO, the SOC tile. The secret the weapon. Tile. Hey, this story is first, Josh. You can't reference <laughs> the air gap story from security. The, the, secret, in security. the secret weapon is that's actually a Pelche in there. Ah, uh, uh, call back, number, call back number two. You can't back forward reference like that. The SOC and the compute tile are doing the same job, you know, as well uh, as actual work. But the filler tile, as Josh was pointing out, is doing the physical interconnecting between the core tile and the mm-hmm. IHS, yes, which is yes. obviously needed in this case. Yes, I see. Yeah. All right. Here is the, the product lineup. We have at the very top Ultra 9 two eight five K just three digits this time for the first time in many years, we have a three digit processor. Oh, since when? I don't know. Oh, Linfield. Yeah. <laughs> Linfield. Maybe Josh Linfield. just pulled that out of the air, Josh. <laughs> and what are the odds? Josh, I bet, I bet somebody like you probably has just to hand a, a platform. Oh, look at what? Are you kidding? 
Look at what? this. It's a Linfield platform. I see three digits. What? There it's are a three digits. Three digits. I seven eight sixty. Oh, Man, is that a seven or an eight, Josh? That's a looks like an. Eight? <sighs> it looks like a seven to me. Josh swears it's an eight. That's a socket uh, LGA eleven fifty six. If I'm uh, not mistaken, I think you're right, Sebastian. That is an eleven fifty six. It just looked like one to me from this angle. Yeah, you could tell. You could That's tell. It's a gigabyte board, right? No, uh, I think it might be Asus. No, Asus. Oh. Oh, I forgot they used blue for a while. They did. Okay. Look at this lineup, by the way. Uh, 24 cores and 24 threads. Hyper threading is gone. It's it's dead. Ooh. Okay. Yep. No more yep. SMT for Intel. We we never needed it anyway. Is that what you're saying? That I, I was sold. I mean, it, here's here's what's it's interesting about this. It's a security feature. Mm. Here's what's interesting about this. It's kind of like we well, remember when the 10th generation really pushed things because we had this 20 cores kind of oblong well yeah. 20 effective we had this oblong uh die that had tacked on two extra cores so we had a 10 core mm -hmm. 20 thread processor just yeah. for one generation and then the 11th gen came out and it was based on the mobile architecture of the time so it maxed out at eight cores 16 threads this is and, th and then of course the performance was not that great until they bumped up the power limits on that post launch this is up to 5.7 gigahertz 11th gen did not have a frequency regression it was just a core count regression mm -hmm. this has a effective core count regression from 32 down to 24 because there's no smt and it also is slower than the outgoing 14900k because this one tops out at 5.7 gigahertz i think they went a bridge too far with the previous two generations as we've talked about extensively mm, okay. here. They're having to reel it in and they're going to have to kind of eat crow with this launch, I guess, because I think the reviews are going to come out and forgetting about the whole instability thing with 13th and 14th gen that we've been going through. And of course, we'll talk about the microcode thing next, but uh, you went from 6 gigahertz to 5.7. You went from 32 effective to 24 total cores with this it's not going to be faster i think that's the the takeaway here and when we were talking to intel at the press briefing it's going to compete with the previous generation but it's not going to beat it except in efficiency yeah. and, and some of the other things like basic everyday computing there are some really attractive things with this new architecture just as we talked about on the mobile side uh, they call it a landmark reduction in power and leadership core performance. Single thread is going to just blow you away because it's half the power consumption in uh, regular, you know, desktop type activities compared to the 14900K. Yeah. So, I mean, I hate to say it, but it looks like Intel's realized that, yeah, us enthusiasts aren't really uh, the lucrative business we used to be. No. And let's focus on business users who are not going to notice the difference at all, except, hey, the battery lasts longer or battery lasts the same, but my laptop is significantly lighter. This chart, the leadership core performance chart is very interesting because if you read the fine print at the bottom, it says it's comparing a 9950X to this new Core Ultra 9285K. And it says desktop processors targeting around 125 watt TDP. So uh, does that mean they're limiting the 9950K to 125 watts for this? Is that how they have it beating it slightly? I I don't know. I, I, don't, I think yeah. it'll be interesting to see actual results from reviewers who have the stuff in hand because we're talking about very slim single digit gains here in three of the four tests. They actually show... 9950x beating it in Geekbench, but uh, one of the questions preemptively answered in the press briefing by Robert Halleck concerned the relative gaming performance of the new flagship Core Ultra 9 part to something like the 7800x3D, and he said he was going to be completely mm -hmm. transparent with everybody, and it doesn't beat it. That the 7800x3D still beats it in gaming. He's, I think he said something like 5%. So that, that sounds pretty optimistic if it's only 5%. Uh, yeah, 
but not what they're aiming at. So who the cares? The biggest difference is just power draw. There's this whole section on elite, the elite gaming experience. Oh, really? Giant leap in performance per watt. And what's weird is they, they're not talking about package power at all. They're not showing package power that I remember. They're talking about power at the wall. And they were actually showing hmm. Interesting. in the little uh, companion video hey. clip, like a, like a kilowatt meter screen or something at don't, the wall. Don't you, think, don't you think that buffers it or buries it a little bit? I It feels like it because they, they talked about the 80 watt reduction in system power during this one gaming demo they showed mm. with a 4090 and two identically configured systems. And Gee, I wonder what's the, using all the power. The Raptor mm. Lake system was 527 watts from the wall, but the new Core Ultra 9 285K was only 447 watts at the wall. So, I, wait a minute. We're using a more efficient power supply on the one system versus the other? Like, what if one of them was titanium rated and the other one was just like 80 plus gold? Mm-hmm. It's <clears throat> it's weird that you're measuring it at the wall and not at the system level. So, yeah. all of these things... I'm a little, I don't know. I'm also I, struggling I, I, to care. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to see that, other than, you know, measuring the actual watts at the socket, is just look at the temperatures. Well, that's, yeah, you I'm know. glad you brought that up, Kent, because no, they promise a okay. cooler and quieter gaming experience with Arrow Lake, averaging 13 degrees cooler package temps versus Where's La- Raptor Lake. Where's Space go? Uh, they're only showing a few games at the uh, temperature differential. Hmm. Well, Although, to be it, honest, hey, sub sixty C gaming that that could lead to a much quieter system. I wonder what the ambient temperature was in that test. Uh, depends on which processor they were testing. A couple of interesting things came out during the the press call. One PL one and PL two by default for the Core Ultra nine. 250 watts. So if you compare that to the current mm. Intel spec, I think it's only, is it 256? 250, I don't remember exactly. I think it's 253. Oh, okay. So it's three watts lower. And they raised uh, TJ Maxx to 105 with these as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I I don't really understand where the reduction in thermals is coming from when the wattage is almost as high and they're allowed to get hotter before they start to throttle now. They still dissipate the same amount of heat at that because it's 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 not it's not uh, uh, SMT. So you actually have areas that will totally power down. Uh, mm. Mm. Because of going through potentially. Good point. Maybe. So depending, on, they were probably great. showing games that were not maxing out all the th- uh, all of the cores and threads. No, they seem mm. to be uh, particular about the games. Well, about, hey, so these new. these more single threaded type of workloads is probably going to be astonishing how low the power draws are. But which really makes this the complete package for PC enthusiasts, according to the slide. I feel elevated. <laughs> it's essential performance. For pure gaming rigs. Oh, that's sorry. That's wow. the Ultra Five. That's the Ultra Five, and then performance at up to 188 watts, lower system power while gaming with the Core Ultra Seven, and the Core Ultra Nine is just the complete package. It's 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 the power and the efficiency. I'm guessing the efficiency is just in the single threaded, daily you know computing tasks. Believe it's it or not, enthusiasts. just enthusiasts. enthusiasts so, as yeah. as was pointed out in the presentation, you know, enthusiasts aren't just gaming twenty four seven as much as they'd like to, yeah. right? We often here use this thing called a part. web browser. Mm. So, mm. well, here comes the AI. It's the, the yeah. We can just skip past the AI. Yeah, AI, AI, NPU, cephalable. Okay, but AI, and then the platform. There is a new platform, eight hundred series chipset. Do you remember when glued chips were a bad thing? <laughs> oh, you strike at the heart. It's not glue. Mm. It's industry-leading packaging, Josh. It is. It, it is, is industry packaging. And uh, I don't think it's in here, but uh, the 
The chips are TSMC, and they range from three to six nanometer, and the mm-hmm. packaging is Intel. It's very complicated. I can't wait to see the the full breakdown by a non tech when this. Um... <laughs> Oh, wait. Oh, Josh, I'm going to need you to actually uh, do some reading and try to break okay. this down for us. Um, so the 800 series chipset, it's a fantastic platform for LGA 1851. Get used to LGA 1851. That's the new one. Forget about 1700. There's more pins. Okay. 48 CPU plus chipset gives chipset. you 48 mm-hmm. lanes. Hey, How many lanes that. off the CPU? C24 24. up there. 24. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of standard for Intel. Yeah. And AMD. Yeah. And all the all the usual yeah, stuff. The, the Wi-Fi, the Intel killer, Wi-Fi 7. You've got up to four Wi-Fi ports of Thunderbolt 5. 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. Get excited. Oh, yeah. I, it's better. Oh, overclocking overhauled. Oh, yeah, because okay. you have fine grain control now. That's about this. This is actually interesting. The previous not so fine grain control. That no, would, it was not. That would kill your speed trees or whatever the hell they call it in their CPUs. You know. There are 16.6 megahertz steps for P and E cores. Dual base clock, tile to tile, uh, and fabric overclocking. This is very complicated. Okay, what's mm-hmm. Cudim? Those are those I'm new things. Oops. The uh, the new oh, the Dim thing. Yeah, they have yeah. the the um, that I see in them. I think oh, it regulates power. Okay, yeah, I vaguely remember ignoring those. Ugh. Yeah, those are going to become important. They were talking about hey, how we'll be- basically the sky is the limit for memory overclocking on this platform, supposedly. So, just go. Well, we know how quick. much that gets you. Apparently, this platform really likes high memory frequencies. Mm. So, it's, uh, it's DDR5 6400 up to 48 gigabytes per DIM, 492 yeah. gigabyte max. ECC well, supported. DDR5 6400 is not. No, uh, but no, but that's that's all all DIM slots populated. For just two yeah, enthusiast right. DIMs, they were doing a lot of their testing at like 7,200 or I think even above. Eight, okay. They said it, they really liked 8,000 and just push it as what high you as want you can. To every single, Wait, I, uh, you, yeah. you skip past the proposed pricing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Kind of important. So the flagship part, 589. Now, I do like that they're actually yeah. doing suggested e-tail price now. It used to be like... 1k tray price and then the retail yeah. price would be about like 50 or 100 dollars more so 589 is what this should appear right. on like new egg amazon for the flagship the core ultra 7 265k should be 394 slightly less for the ks that's a big jump but yeah this kind of feels familiar this is not unusual this is like the four months after launch pricing yeah mm. kind of from previous you got generations. Between that, uh, the five and the seven, if you feel like it. Three seven nine. Yeah, there's yeah, room for another the... model in there. Believe it or not, Intel they have a lot of partners in the the PC hardware industry. Uh, look at that! Everybody, everybody will have this. I think they're just happy. They're ready. They're like, wait a minute! It, it runs a little bit cooler. <laughs> And it doesn't take like crazy amounts of voltage, and there's no instability that we know of. And, and there won't be great. much returns. All yeah, right, I'm cool. Let's do it. Let's let's adopt it faster than ever before. We'll hear about that in the next earnings call. Like the uh, adoption of the new uh, Intel desktop platform has been the greatest ever. Phen- phenomenal. Just phenomenal. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, do you want to buy a 13th or 14th gen Core i9? It's fixed now. We have a fair stock of them. We, we got some microcode for you. Yeah. Great lead in to the, the next story. Yeah. It's finally okay to buy an Intel desktop processor again. You've heard it here first on the piece. We've been vocal about this issue on this podcast, mm-hmm. recommending you go with something from Team Red, for example. Or really, it should be Team Green, but you know what I'm they saying? I guess green. it's Team Orange yeah. now. 
if you look at the boxes, every, everything Ryzen is, I just drop one on the floor. Everything Ryzen is orange now. It's hmm. their signature. So You're team card orange. Carrying, card carrying member as well, from what I know. Do you, you know the best thing about Intel CPUs? They're like all on sale and all actually available. Because enthusiasts don't want them, but yes. I mean, it, <laughs> whether they're all available because they're unpopular or because they made a lot of them and haven't sold them all for another reason, I don't know. But Intel, they were still working on finding the cause, the root cause of the voltage issue. And now you can safely go out and buy, put this here, you can what safely you go out and buy the 14900K now. It's okay. Because we finally have a permanent <gasps> voltage fix. There's Ooh. another microcode. Forget that other microcode, which I think was had a nine in it or something. That was not the no. code you were looking there's, for? No. There's 129. 129. Yeah, mm -hmm. so and now it's, forget the nine, that's been replaced with a B. You it's want X. 0x12b, which is probably a beta BIOS right now, at least it was for the board that I was flashing, so. What if it's not 2b? That is the question. Mm -hmm. yes. Isn't the sonnet like 14 lines? Are they going Shakespeare oh, yeah. on us? That's interesting. That's interesting even this up, Josh. Uh, I don't think that there's that much thought behind that, but maybe. <laughs> it really should be 129B if this is a continuation of 129. What was the 9 for? And wouldn't it go up to 13? The next integer pushing? No, it, was yeah. one, no, it would have been 12A. 1210, but four <laughs> digits would just be crazy. Yeah. Texts. I mean, it's just a waste of space. <laughs> Yeah, hold on. Uh, well, you mean the whole processor lineup, or or this this name? No, you almost sound this... like Steve. Is this just a waste of silicon? No, you guys. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, anyway, it's safe to buy uh, Intel processors again. Apparently, to me, this only matters to the enthusiast space. Somebody, I think, correctly pointed out in our live chat a couple minutes ago that uh normies don't care about things like this they're not even aware of this micro code what average consumer who doesn't build pcs doesn't watch our show and even know what a micro code update is mm. and mm -hmm. so those are those collectible cars you used to buy that you know oh, the yeah. guy talked really they, fast they brought those back they brought you can buy micro yeah. machines again yeah but for the diy enthusiasts are, aren't they so much more likely to go with amd it's the only real question is do you go AM4 or sure. AM5? Like right now, if you're an enthusiast, if all you care about is gaming and your CPU will just get out of the way and all that matters is how much you can spend on a GPU, do you really want an Intel 13th or 14th gen processor, which probably still pulls 250 to 300 watts, even with the voltage adjustment? Okay. But I want USB 4 and Thunderbolt. You can get those now. I'm yeah, I can get them now. Boards. Yeah. I just want to pay yeah. the price. You gods. Yeah. Well. I was going to say something, and I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. But this segment is on like fire. Life right is now. fleeting. Um. <clears throat> Well, okay, Razor. guys like HP and Dell and them, I mean, they are very conservative with their builds. Yes, yeah. they and are. So I would really be curious what uh, their return rate is for a lot of these processors they build because, again, their engineers are not dumb. Um, they, but the company they work for is very cheap. Yeah, and yeah. so you've got to be really careful with how you spec out your stuff because you just don't want it frank. You don't want your power phases burning up. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of these, you know, pre-builts and whatnot are, are lower performance than what you can get in retail because, you know, retail is what the benchmarkers use. It's what the enthusiasts use. It's, it's the people who are on YouTube and Twitch and whatnot, and they've built their own systems and they benchmark things and they, they, they absolutely max performance. And um, the guys at Dell don't want to do that. 
because it costs more money per CPU to uh, to do these things. I mean, it, uh, not only CPU, but uh, per per machine that they sell. So, yeah, it would be really interesting to find out return rates of uh, of these OEM machines uh, because guys like Falcon Northwest and Puget, um, they do tweak theirs a lot higher and they use, you know, kind of retail motherboards rather than uh, yeah. uh, home design stuff. So, yeah, maybe we can have, I, I doubt Kel could talk about this stuff, but it would be interesting no. to find out. So Kel's always been pretty open about this kind of stuff and often in our live chat, actually, while we record these. And one of the things, and he, actually, he was right at the forefront of the coverage about the microcode issue to begin with as they were trying to figure out some of the instability issues, because they do a lot of their own, they burn in test every system that goes out. So they try to look for any kind of issues. But I, I know when Puget Systems came out with their little study that showed that AMD processors fail just as often, if not more, in their systems out in the field. Well, Puget also uses their own custom bio settings, including their own limits on the CPU. So clearly some of their own internal testing had shown, why don't we set this power limit down and not allow it to mm-hmm. use as much voltage because really it's, it's a marginal difference. It depends on the sample, obviously. Like, yeah. And, and plus, yeah, I mean, your peak numbers are going to be peak numbers and, but, but experience is going to be, it's going to be nearly the same. I mean, if you just calm it down a little bit, it'll last longer. Well, Kent, what is, what did you say your voltage is set to on yours? Which obviously yours is overclocked. But uh, one point four one five. Yeah, that's so uh, low. I mean, that's yeah. that's lower than AMD, and you're running a Core i nine thirteenth gen, right? The thirteen nine hundred thirteen nine hundred KS. Yeah. So it's really, it's it's just that annoying lowest common denominator thing that everybody does, where you come up with this crazy high voltage. Anybody who's done overclocking of graphics cards, it's the same thing. Like, you got to back the voltage off. There's no reason why a Radeon yeah. card needs to be as high as it is. Back it off, see where you find that stability. Less voltage gives you more headroom thermally, and so on and so on. All right, well, we've probably beaten this subject into the ground. So nothing could be more exciting than a deep dive into Zen 5 DDR5 frequency scaling. It's what people have been demanding. Not only are they excited about jumping into a new AM5 processor, and not only that, but one of the latest 9000 series processors. We really want to know how memory scales. I'm guessing it doesn't scale much farther than 6,000 megatransfers per second. But let's see, because they tested up to 8,000 megatransfers per second over at Tech Power Up. That sounds insane, but they were willing to risk it. I don't even want to know what kind of voltage they had to run to get there. Yeah, it wasn't that ridiculous. You know you're in-depth when you're doing SOC, IO die, power draw charts for they, memory. They do modules. like their giant long charts. Just in case you needed to know, DDR5-6000 at idle was drawing 12.1 watts. Now you know why memory has its own power phases. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this definitely. Isn't for, no, look, this is for the faint of heart. <laughs> no, not at all. No. Uh, Very much so. The idea I, is that, hey, we've been complaining about, you know, use DDR5-6400. You've got a one-to-one U clock to M clock. It's really important. But people are starting to say, well, yeah, but I can, some of these newer boards can do DDR5-8000. So, you know, as long as the timings aren't ridiculous, isn't that going to start to overclumb uh, having the U-clock 1-to-1 instead of dropping down to 2-to-1 as it does, unless you're on the exact end, you know, you have to fiddle around because even on a good motherboard, you're not guaranteed to get that 1-to-1 just because, for whatever reason, your DDR decides to dip a little bit higher or lower. And yeah, it turns out that, hey, there is some very rare scenarios where the extra bandwidth will get you a bit more, like switch emulation. Hey, DDR5-7200. 0.5 FPS. It's a huge, huge difference. You definitely notice it. Because, you know, paying a lot extra for RAM always pays off in the end. It, it Wait, totally noticeable. Great investment. Emulation. We're not allowed to do that anymore. 
No, just mentioning on the show will have us taken down by Nintendo tomorrow. That, that oh. is that's likely, yes. So let's see. Here's some gaming. I didn't. I don't. I don't want to look at it, but I will. Let me go back to the list. Uh, you just they, zip you through can't it, look but... away. They they did. Oh my goodness! When, when oh, did these end? Oh my god! I just, so I just many. Want, I just no. Want to get back to no the end. navigation drop down thing? Okay, here we go. Ah. They actually did gaming testing at 720p with a 4090, and in this extremely common, in this extremely common and totally valid testing scenario, the 6400 kit was 0.2% faster relative to the 8000 kit. Which I would call a margin. That's significantly error, lower price. Kind of so oh, stick God, with yeah. 6,400, okay? And guess what? Yeah. DDR5, 6,000? 6, 6,000 now performed it. <laughs> yeah, so let's just let's just do DDR5, 6,000. You know what? And and use, use a, a lower voltage. Don't exceed 1.35 volts. Don't. Be no, like me don't and run stuff blithely at 1.4 and 1.45 on am5 boards and then have a memory stick die and then another one die and system fail to boot and you don't know what's going on and yeah. isn't the lesson here stop feeling superior for your memory choices it really doesn't matter a whole heck bigger much. number better <laughs> if you can't it's feel superior for your memory choices what can you feel superior about our next story, if you are looking for a NAS that goes faster than NASCAR, Jeremy, I mean, looking right. for that one. Aren't we all looking for a little little piece of NAS? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, God. Some fast you know action. How about the You're Terra Master? Fast NAS. The F8 SSD Plus, 10 gigabit connectivity, all flash. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. See, the 10 gigabyte Ethernet is actually the bottleneck at this point. Because <laughs> they did shove uh, a little chip in there. So that technically, yes. I mean, you can complain that essentially they're all just buy one SSDs. But there's eight of them. And that produces an obnoxious amount of bandwidth. And one of the things that uh, TerraMaster did that uh, serve the home really liked was that instead of cheaping out with like an N series Intel or sort of the, the N50 5105 or the, the older versions, they went with a brand new Core i3 N305. So it's hmm. proper eight core in there with uh, you know some serious connectivity. If you want USB 3.2 Gen 2 to you know max out, this is the thing that will do it. If you're you know, that 10 gigabit Ethernet is just not being strained. Populate this thing, rate it, and give it a shot. It's it's insane. It, it's fairly expensive. Not as expensive as some of the others. And one of the nice things is that they actually ship with uh, eight M.2 heat sinks. So you don't actually have to buy uh, your SSDs that have the heat sinks. You can save a little bit of money and strap on the included ones with the rubber bands that it comes with, but don't worry, it doesn't get hot enough that the rubber bands are going to snap too soon. Uh, it's just impressive. Isn't this about what 10 you years too late? Yes. Frame yes, it is, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm frustrated about. It's like, we should have had this a while ago. Mm. We're just starting to get them. I mean, yes, at That's enterprise price. level, you could have done this, but, oh. What's what's the price on this? Not unpopulated. Uh, it was around eight hundred, I believe. Ooh, that is a bit pricey, I if I recall. Close. It's not ridiculous, but but it includes the heat sink, so uh, that's, yeah. that's got to be at least forty dollars in value right there. <laughs> yeah, the 10G oh, it's networking. actually down to seven hundred. Oh, okay. Okay. Ten yeah. G networking is still a little bit pricey, so okay. And you can get and the non plus, which I believe has the slower processor in it for like five. Here's the thing that gets hmm. me about these, and not just because okay, exactly because I had one of these fail yes. on my NAS, but yeah. you have all that technology and all that nice packaging, and then you're just using some generic looking 
laptop replacement adapter that looks like you paid eight dollars for it on Amazon. So hopefully this is good quality and well shielded, and these certifications aren't fake. Seventy two watts. That's actually not very, not uh, very uh, impressive from a power supply perspective. Mm. It's a lot of silicon. But you're you're powering. That's almost enough to power Sebastian's RAM. SSDs. <laughs> well, yeah, each each SSD is going to be what five to six watts yep. max, maybe twelve. Yeah, you've got, you've, you have eight of them in there, and so that's 40, 48. Oh, that's 40. eight of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. I'm going to look this up right now. Terra Master F8 SSD Plus on Amazon, and an and an i3, you know, isn't free with eight with eight cores. It's, what if I told you? That if you went to Amazon.com <laughs> okay. right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, use the serve the home link so they get commission for this, that you would save one hundred dollars with a coupon. So it'd be only you know six. It would only be six ninety nine at okay, that point. Okay, that actually that sounds pretty good actually. Yeah. What's you can use that savings the, by better well, power supply. Yeah. What's the difference between the F eight SSD and the F eight SSD plus? Well, the plus includes heat sinks. Let's see, what is it? I don't know. Let's see. This one has the eight core i3. Yeah, I think the other thing is the the processor are, itself. Are the M dot twos are they PCI three or four? Oh, I'm yeah, guessing they're four core. Three. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the see, you've got the okay. M ninety five quad core. Okay, so you still save a hundred dollars if you go with the F eight non plus, but it only has half the cores. Okay, half the cores, half the GPU. And it also has a hundred dollar coupon. Yeah. So. Coupon. Hey. All right, so an interesting addition. I'm sure we'll see more and more of these as you know the the, yes. the, Flash the packaging gets cheaper and cheaper. Yeah, it's 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 smaller than most <clears throat> enthusiast routers, and it's it's holding a ridiculous amount of storage, and it's fast. And and, and once this board pattern gets released, you start to see copycats or mm -hmm. different versions mm -hmm. of a very similar environment, very similar system come out. Interesting. Uh, also from Serve the Home, it almost looks like one of the drives out of that last article because here we have a rubber banded heat sink on an SSD. It is. They use Gen 3 uh, in their build for the okay. NAS because why not? So it's the end. Well, it's the end of the road. There's Gen the reason. Gen 3 SSDs. Yeah, the, the, those pull five to six watts versus four or five. So, the fours, yeah. yeah. Some folks pointed out in our Terra Master F8 review and even in our Asus Store Flash Store reviews, quoting Serve the Home here, that we were using PCIe Gen 4 drives. The reason is really simple. There is not as much innovation and competition in the Gen 3 4 terabyte drives to the point that oftentimes the Gen 4 drives are both available and cost competitive, if not better, on both counts, etc. So, so they're not available, it's just they don't find them relevant. That, well, they say it's getting harder well, to find. They're going to out. The inexpensive Gen 3 M.2 drives. So yeah. if you haven't gotten and one, now a, might be the time. When you use a 4 drive, it will take you down to Gen 3 on that platform. You know, and that's, the <clears throat> controller will be less power hungry. Hmm, this continues to illustrate oh. storage is just so much more interesting. It, the, one of the most... I don't know what I'm trying to say here. My mind isn't working very well. We we have picked storage over and over and over and over as picks of the week, even through those dark times when you couldn't buy a GPU for less than double MSRP, if even that. Storage continued to get bigger and relatively cheaper. And you can buy, say, a Gen 4 drive, and it will work as a Gen 2 or a Gen 3 if that's the board that you have. It, wouldn't it be great if memory was like that? You can't buy... <laughs> DDR4 and have it work in a DDR5 board at a lower speed. It's just, I mean, you have to change memory standards. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it have been nice? Because there was a time when DDR3 became more expensive than DDR4 just because of availability mm -hmm. and weren't really making it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Same thing right. seems to be happening now. DDR, I mean, NVMe Gen 3 is, you don't need it because Gen 4 works as Gen 3 and the controllers got cheap and it's the same NAND. So... I think it is time for In Security Corner. Welcome to In Security Corner, your weekly reason to drink. 
Jeremy Golden was on Jackal? fire. Jeremy was on fire this week. There's just so much I am not, security issues going on this week. I mean, I'm not even the Internet Archive, this. you know, <laughs> everybody's getting whacked this week. So, Jeremy, take it away. Yeah, no, this has been a very bad week for blood pressure in the industry. And, yeah, we're starting out with one of the, the nastiest ones, which is Golden Jackal. It's... Uh, essentially a modular toolkit for getting data out of air gapped systems you know the ones that are not connected to anything and so therefore should be completely and totally untouchable except you know you need to do a usb drive to transfer data in and out and so what they've done is developed essentially two separate modular toolkits that are specifically targeted at USB drives that would hit air gap systems because air gap systems don't just, you don't just plug in a random USB drive and it goes, okay, new drive detected, let's go ahead. No, these are special drives. They're, they're special things because we're talking about industrial controlling machines. We're talking about you know, secret federal databases, the stuff you don't want messed with. And so this group, uh, who have actually been around for a little while now, have oh Sierra Pole, I really don't need to know that. Like seriously, just don't don't tell me things have gotten worse. Uh, so this specifically designed backdoor for either systems which are likely to have uh, a USB drive plugged into them, or emails that are going to be connected to an internet device, which will eventually get connected to the USB from an air gap device and ones that just randomly upload to Google drive. And these have been out there for a while. We just haven't figured it out until relatively recently how well they're doing. They're ridiculously hard to detect because they just sort of sit there and do absolutely nothing until a certain set of uh, scenarios or a certain set of things happen, in which case, boom, it immediately jumps in, does the job, exfiltrates, shuts itself down again. You don't even have time to notice the bloody thing is there. And it's, we're lucky that uh, a couple of people did manage, ESET and a couple of others did manage to find it, essentially because, oh crap, uh, some files that were on an gap server have now made it into the wild. Let's track back how this possibly could have happened. It's uh, great. And the best uh, part is that the initial infection, ESET and Kapersky, still don't know how it works. They know it does, but they're not quite sure how. The, the scary thing is our modern life is is uh, sort of pyramided atop a set of industrial control systems that may or may not even be air-gapped. Let's just assume that your, um, your whatever industrial control system that we'd like to perpetually believe in is safe they've air gapped it you know as a as a preventative uh, uh security um posture guess what um they're carrying these things you know as updates and things like that you know it happens it's not necessarily a federally secured facility but they're running uh your water supply your sewage yeah, your electric power stuff. um they're they're handling components that uh that do things like load trucks for food supply or route packaging or packages or whatever. Uh, this would um, uh, set back modern civilization should these things uh, come to a halt uh, faster uh, than you can say hurricane to Florida or hurricane to North Carolina. Didn't uh, uh, the water major water company down south just get uh, screwed over today? They sure did. Yes, they did. Yeah. And water supply. And it could well you know, have been so, this. There's examples out there of Mother Nature sort of affecting the same outcome, um, unfortunately. Um, uh, modern modern life is precarious in many ways. So no one in the chat is getting the picture. Josh, did you catch the reference of that uh, picture? There's a Im there's an image in the eye. I didn't see Day of the it. Jackal. Oh. No, they're re they're remaking one. that, you know, with Eddie Redman. Oh, no, oh, great. That's more news I don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's unfortunately correct. Friendly Ghost saying the yep and a crap ton of those systems are not secured whatsoever. Like Jeremy no. was saying, a water water supply, like American Water, I think was. Yeah, that's like the that. one. Yeah, just got hit. Next uplifting story. This comes from Bleeping Computer. Qualcomm patches high severity zero day exploits. Mm-hmm. Now they wanted to play in the desktop slash laptop PC space. I don't know if this is one of those or if it's existing like mobile chipsets. Oh, DSPs. Yeah, DSP. Impacting it's dozens very common. of chipsets. Okay. It's very yeah. common in like audio <laughs> audio processing, you which you probably imagine that Qualcomm's part of a few mobile devices. So, you know, it happens. Uh, so you're looking at uh, at direct memory access issues with uh, file descriptors uh, being leveraged to trigger a use after free, a typical memory situation where the program counter uh, can be walked into a uh, formerly uh, freed memory space where you may have just um, inadvertently dropped your uh, malware payload and the program counter will happily go and execute those instructions uh, for, for you on your behalf. So, but this... Seems to be uh, targeted at, at some specific targets. I'm not really sure who uh, is holding the phone or the Qualcomm uh, enabled device. In this case, Jeremy, you may have a better idea on this. So, but they've also, I don't know if they've come up with a patch for this one yet. So I'm I'm kind of at uh, a loss as well to go with that one. The, the best thing is that, yes, Qualcomm has come up with a patch. You're not buying these devices directly from Qualcomm, though. You're hoping that whoever it is that bought the Qualcomm chip that then went into the product they sold you is actually going to bother to patch it and not either just throw it at the window and say, okay, now uh, we're discontinuing that one. We're going to version two and we're not going to tell anyone or that, you know, they just don't bother to patch it. What about IOT? What if it's in an IOT device, Jeremy? Then your SOL with oh. your IoT. I'll just throw out my fridge. It's fine. I don't. I don't need it. Yeah, but please continue to use this device as a as a tempting target for malware. I suppose. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of we need mobile devices. DDoSs. There's a uh, yeah, really. There's a lot of <laughs> mobile devices out there that obviously are using a lot of uh, Qualcomm chips. So, and they make attractive targets. And as Jeremy points out, they may not always get updates. This could be things like security cams or smart doorknobs or smart toasters, as as Sebastian was implying. (laughs) I think my only smart appliances are the washer and dryer, but I have that turned off. Or so I think. My dryer is probably listening to me right now, actually. Your dryer dryer will probably kill you tonight, by the way. Yeah, it happens. It's possible. It runs on natural gas, so it'll just cause a leak. Oh, this yep, could happen. Yep. This actually could happen. Yeah, could happen. I love you, LG dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Smart bidet. That would be bad. Smart oh. bidet. Exactly. <laughs> well, how did he die? <laughs> well, <laughs> about that. Now the bidet says he wasn't eating enough fiber. <laughs> <laughs> next story. Hackers fall harvest. Verizon, AT&T, and Lumen Technologies traffic. I don't know if I emphasize the right words there. Uh, Jeremy, what is this all about? Uh, the, like this week, literally, we can't go a day without a significant data breach. And a bunch of us that are like, yeah, we knew this was coming. We told you this was coming. Why are you acting so shocked? So in this case, it's something called Salt Typhoon, uh, which is the name Microsoft gave them. There's a couple of other companies giving them different names because they've been around the block a few times. And what they've been doing is sitting in uh, the networks of Verizon, AT&T, and Lumen. So, you know, not very big companies that no one here ever uses to communicate with. But they've been sitting in there and intercepting traffic for a while. We're not quite sure how long. And we're not quite sure how much they got or what they might have got because all three companies have decided to double down on the security through obscurity and just aren't telling anyone 
how long they've been hacked, how much access they got, or if they've even managed to kick them out at this point. Uh, it's been great. It's just been silent since, uh, what was this, Tuesday, I think, that this one was this hit. And yet we know that uh, it's definitely Chinese-backed. Uh, we know that huge volumes of traffic have been being grabbed, but as far as AT&T and Verizon and Lumen are saying, is like, no, we, uh, we don't really want to comment on this. It's, uh, you know, uncomfortable, much like a, an AI bidet. Expect to find horrible things about this in a month or two once people actually start to see what's for sale and, uh, you know, pick it up and take a look through it. It's it's not good. Nothing this week has been good. Well, and we're not at least even if, done yet. At least if you run Linux, you can't get malware, right? So <laughs> true. That's, oh, that man. is the takeaway from the segment every week is you know Windows wait, this, two Windows OS that. one um, cup. Right. Wait. Wait. Wait a minute. What is what is this? Oh. Perfect L. Perf CTL. Perf CTL. Mm. Linux malware? Brett, you want to take this depression? You no, but I do the have to say thing, that you're going to tell very... me that there's malware on Mac, the most secure platform <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Brett, um, is is the Mac our last hope for a secure platform that doesn't just spy on us? And no, it's been done on the Mac as well. I mean, I'm oh, not okay. stupid, uh, right? Yeah. Okay, exactly. Well, I, I, I may didn't accuse you of being stupid. I just I, I may be, you. I may be artificial, but I'm not dumb. Yes. Okay. But I mean, who so, the hell wants to hack DSD anyways? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, itself, you have to right? ad- you have to admire practically the perfect organism that is Perf CTL. So this, I'm going to keep the <sighs> aliens references going. It's a uh, it's a piece of malware that's uh, re- only recently been discovered, which actually very very cleverly disguises its own existence by hiding amongst files and processes that would normally be within a, uh, a Linux environment. So you can't even see it when it's running. And if you do potentially detect, hey, something's uh, wrong with my Linux box, so you're going to log in, it actually notices that a sysadmin is logging in and perhaps doing some process investigation and takes uh, extreme measures to not give its own existence away and actively hides from the ability for admins to track it down and 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 kill it. In fact, there was uh, an example, Jeremy, which you wrote about the uh, sysadmin um, removing every possible file and reference and process and startup uh, script that may have enabled uh, this nefarious malware to run and then uh, rebooted the system and it came back, it came back again. So literally potentially thousands of systems may be infected by this since 2021. Um, I'm not even sure they entirely know what it's really even doing, but it's manipulating uh, processes. Uh, it clearly has uh, an external control environment. Um, I, I think the, the, the most interesting part is the potential uh, leverageability. Is that even a word? Yes. Of, yeah. uh, well, you just, of, just now. You just precedented it as a word. I did. I did. Thank you Whoa. for following it up with precedented. Um, what I'm saying is, is that the the library of obscurity that is potentially a, a real key to um, the next most damaging bit of malware that can circumvent all the abilities to observe it. I think uh, malware that can skirt observability is. Uh, I don't want to say, but uh, I I don't envy your chances. No, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, there, there's links to detect if you've got it, and a variety of ways to avoid getting it. If you got it, well, sorry, um, that sucks. It's we're working on that. All right, you might nuke it from orbit. So, the only real solution is just never go online. Is what you're saying. Un- oh, unplug no. it. Then you're air gaffed and you're mean... screwed as of the first story. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't mean you're not infected. Yes, and as Jeremy <laughs> points out, then you're air gapped. 
someday you'll carry a USB across that air gap, and then you're yep. finished. All right, we need we need a positive story. Okay, what's next? What's next? A 3.8 terabit per second DDoS attack. Is that a record? You know, it yes. is indeed. Wow. It's high. Yeah. Good, Jeremy. It's it's just. I mean, it's impressive. It, it, it is a high, so I mean, you wanted you wanted to end on this on a high. Well, there you go. That beats the uh, last, which was I believe about three point four terabits. Uh, and this one is all of those buddy iOS machines and Asus home routers, Microtech systems, DVRs. Mm. That's what makes security a US cams. Attack. Security cams, Everything. doorknobs, baby cams, your your bloody doorknob. That uh, what was that thing that you pushed on Amazon to the bu- easy button to order yeah, stuff on Amazon? Sebastian's smart fridge and his smart dryer are definitely taking yeah, part. Just in the, the smart dryer. I don't, I don't have a smart fridge. Okay, Hold never mind. Sure. Just this the smart dryer is definitely taking part in this DDoS attack. That's great. Yeah. And How do you get that much bandwidth? Was, you pwn a lot of people. You just take over. You've got huge botnets out there. What are my system is uh, running slower? I've heard about win rot. No, you're 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 mm-hmm. infected. You're part of a an immense sort of a area. gigantic immense. DDoS attack. Yeah. Because the Internet of Things is just wonderful, and I'm so glad it exists and continues to this day. Now this wasn't like a like a daily, you know, a peak and then it disappeared. This happened over a month, and the only reason yes. we knew this is because it was being mitigated by Cloudflare. Really, who were <laughs> just shocked at the amount of effort it took to actually mitigate it to be able to shut this down. But yeah, hey, so Cloudflare, the Cloudflare not to be confused with Cloud Strike. Strike Cloud yeah. Strike. Not no, to be, that's not to be confused. No. no. Or cloud strife, right, right. Protagonist Luckily, we're Fantasy. we're continuing to keep the valuable contributions from both Russia and Vietnam connected to the worldwide internet, so that things like this giant DDoS attack can can take place. Yeah. You know what you did can I do? Yeah, you still got you know still you can made do? Up 10%. You you With did say that, that out loud, and I think it needed to be said. So, mm. regardless of the policies, it needed to be said. Yeah. yeah. No, but 50% came to Russia and Vietnam, but U.S. was a good 10%. Yeah, but, but at 3.8 uh, terabits? Yeah. All right. That's, that's... And now it's time for a something of a developing story to cap off in Security Corner. The Internet Archive has been hacked. A data breach impacting 31 million users as of, this is a, a story at Bleeping Computer from 6.22 p.m. Eastern today. So, uh... Stop the world, I want to get off. <laughs> a JavaScript alert shown on archive.org uh. said, Have you ever felt like the Internet Archive runs on sticks and is constantly on the verge of suffering a catastrophic security breach? It just happened. See 31 million of you on HIBP. Have I been pwned? I been pwned? <laughs> yeah. Oh, a 6.4 gigabyte SQL file. Shocking. IA mm-hmm. underscore users dot SQL. Email address, screen name, password, change, timestamps. Oh, it's only Hash. 31 million. I mean, Passwords. come on. Yeah. Good. Man, 31 crazy. million as a number. Is that a lot? <sighs> I don't know, Brett. Is that a lot? Is it's, that, a, is that a bad data breach? It feels like a lot. <laughs> it's only 10% of the U.S. population. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, I mean, it's not as bad as almost all the U.S. population, which we had with the what was the name of that company out of Florida? It was it like the Secure Data mm-hmm. Enclave or something? What was the name of there? <sighs> so, I don't remember. They have like everybody's information. Hmm. Yeah, hundred million people. Something That's like awesome. I mean, like right. the IRS. Yeah, I think it's time for gaming quick hits. And our first story: an all new Red Dev. Red Dead Redemption 2 sequel drops on October 29. 
Are you excited? Well, okay. It's not it's the like, wait a minute. Wait, are you teasing? Sequel. It says it's not exactly. At least us PC gamers get to play it in the right order. Oh, it happens. Jeremy, after what are you doing? Two. Oh, say say RDR what? RDR two happens okay. before Red Dead Redemption. But not that okay, I that... know because I've owned a console since the the NES. So I've never had a chance in all of these fourteen years to play it until October 29th, mm. when it finally gets ported to the PC. How old is this? This seems, this seems backwards. 14 years. Okay, so oh, it's not it's, new. It is new to the PC. It's not even released yet. It's it's How newly old? old? Oldly new? Old is new again? <laughs> yeah, that's what... So for whatever get excited about PC Red gaming Redemption where you can 2. buy 14-year-old console ports. But yes. unlike Starfield, it will support ultra wide out of the box. Oh, PCMR. Still does oh it. yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is why this is why you pay through the nose for the latest in, you know, CPU. Oh, friendly ghost, it will graphics, play like ass for at least the first six months. And so you can play then they'll finally figure it out. Console prequels from fourteen years ago. Got it. I'm sure it's not a straight up port. Nobody likes console ports, right? Right. Aren't all games yeah. console Damn ports now? Right, hey, hey, let's talk about another lot. sequel because there's nothing new under the Actually, sun. every one of these is a sequel thing. But That's yeah, great. Yeah. That's the state of the industry. That or a remaster is, or yeah. remake or a reimagining. Alien, Alien Isolation getting a sequel 10 years later. I didn't know it was 10 years old. But I guess so. We're all 10 years older, Brett. Get used to I it. I know. Ay, ay, ay. 10th anniversary. Seems only fitting that they should release or think about releasing a new one. That's it. All right. But it is. Yep. The next link actually shows that it's still relatively popular. It's a lot of DLC that actually went with it. And uh, they just had a huge sale a little while ago. It was like, yeah, yeah it's probably 1979 seems right about you. No. 57. No. No. I was born in 82. Keep going. You there you go. See if you page. Okay. Well, you are, you are old enough to see it. I am. Okay. So, I mean, it's still season pass is still $20. If you scroll down, I think the whole kit is like 40 bucks still. Yeah. Yeah. The full, the full onslaught collection is $50. Well, how isolated is it? If you have all those friends. Uh, it's not extremely isolated if you have a lot of friends, but the point is it goes on sale, you know, for like 80% off every now and then, but it's mm. still commanding high prices, even after 10 years, I think a sequel to isolation would be popular. I can see why they're doing it. The most frightening you know, moment I've only... ever had. Go ahead, Josh. I think it only ran the benchmark of alien isolation. Mm. You say that mm. about a lot of I... games. Yeah. I don't think Josh. Well, the most frightening moment I ever had in, in a video game occurred during Alien Isolation. It is when scary of, AF. <laughs> it, it, there's a lot of tenseness that builds up in it. And one night, uh, my one of our cats actually walked into the room unbeknownst to me as I'm crawling <laughs> through a vent on this space station and just suddenly goes, meow. And I almost <laughs> shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say because my scariest moment in gaming ever I haven't played that game there I was at my PC somebody broke into my home and you know right. <laughs> it's because sound sound is so important I think sound yes. worked into games as a trigger is very very interesting and has a What's certain the other game where you always talk about the sound being so integral to the experience System Shock 2 System yes. Shock 2 That's yeah. Right. yeah insane for audio yep <clears throat> I actually, I actually said to someone who came in the room once when I was playing it, I was, I said, Shh, they'll hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Alien Isolation did that with sound. There were so many just creepy sounds on the station, but they did it with shadows too. And this is yeah. before ray tracing. Um, you would be walking along and there would just be like, just a random like lamp or something would fall over and you would see the shadow of something moving and you would just be like, what was that? Was that a xenomorph? What, you know, it, it did a great job in just building this tension. Wait, Kent, are you saying that you had an immersive, memorable gaming experience in the age before RTX on? 
Yes. Wow. Mm. wow. How many, so how many possible. of these stories will be told 10 years from now about, and then I got the RTX card and I turned on Ray Trace Shadows? I could not believe it. I was terrified because suddenly <clears throat> those shadows that weren't there before, they were there. And it you know really what? improved no the one. experience. Okay. No one will say that. All right, uh, who doesn't want a game based on a film? The Rocky Horror Show a video film. game. Yes. So let's do the time warp again. Yeah, it's awesome. It's just a jump to the left and a step to the and right. A step to the right. Put your hands on your hips in all its eight bit glory. Yep. Brad and Janet. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> it looks like Damn an NES game. Damn. Yes. For real. Yeah. So they're actually updating this and they're going to bring it out, bring it out like it, as Sebastian was saying, practically NES level gaming it's coming out in 2024. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is practically forever. Be more. Practically. Be, yeah. Oh, this was. Uh, what do they say? Uh, Tim Curry's high water mark. <laughs> the Rocky Horror Man. He's got the DVD right at hand. <laughs> it's got both the uh, Canadian or the US and the UK version. They are different. There's a films. UK version. Okay, there what is, was different and it's about different. The, what the accents? Right, because people Besides in the UK they speak lines. with a British accent. That's what I've learned. Uh, yeah, a little bit, but not so much. Okay. Uh, Do tell. Okay. There are it. lines that. Uh, are f- colloquialisms for America that don't fly over in Britain quite as well. So they, they go a little bit dirtier in the UK because it's yeah, typical. It's, it's their way. Mm-hmm. And because it wouldn't fly with the sensors over here. So if you get to watch the UK version, it's almost more enjoyable. Really? Hmm. Meatloaf has a little more fun. Meatloaf so has a little scenes- more fun. There so Brett I didn't even know seen. about the UK edit. I didn't. Interesting. Did they so they concurrently film these, or was there just like dubbing involved? I wonder. No, they they did two different performances. Wonderful. Two wow. completely different recordings. And if you're an aficionado, you will notice that no, even though the time warp is the same, it's not quite the same because a human doesn't do the exact same thing twice. Hmm. Mm-hmm. On that note, we'll see what brand new and exciting pick Josh might have on our next segment, Picks of the Week. Mr. Walrath, uh, what do you have for us? I have for you uh, a thing which is kind of computer adjacent. Mm-hmm. So you remember back in the days when you would have uh, Peltier cooling? Peltier? Oh, yes. Peltier, whatever you want to call it. Yes, monumentally Essentially, you, you cooling, apply yes. you apply a current to this block, and one part becomes hot, and the other part becomes cold. But if you turn it around, and you heat the bottom, but oh, you wow. have a cooling device on top, it creates an actual current mm. in there, and that current drives a fan. And so these... Stovetop fans, which you put on top of your hot, uh, your 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 your, your wood burning stove, uh, helps to circulate the air without applying any kind of electricity to it. So you just put that on top of your stove. The base heats up. You've got cooling fins on the top. Next thing you know, you're you're driving current into wow. a uh, into a fan, and it's mm. spinning and it's moving air. Wow. And it works really well. I bought one of these because... Is this your living room, Josh, that you're looking at here? It's no, very it's nice. Not, it's not my living room. Oh, I felt like that hardly room. Room. Mm. Mm. Okay. Anyway. You've had, a, um, hot, you've had a, a wood stove without one of those for this long. Yeah. Yeah. Can I'm amazed. It? Yeah. So, I, Jeremy, I looked at one uh, years ago, and when the technology was still kind of new, and we were going to get it from Home Depot, and it was like 150 bucks. And it, wow. we just didn't feel it was really worth it because we were poor. Um, and I had spent all my money on computer hardware. And sure. uh, now that <laughs> these are 30 bucks and, you know, 
pretty nice, then hey, why not? I may even buy a second one, point one in the other direction. Ooh. The Look other side, he's, the, uh, he's on his couch, freezing, and mm-hmm. all the heat is just going up to his ceiling and avoiding just, him in his yeah, cat. Yeah, yes, because you don't yes. have a uh, a fan on your ceiling to. And then look at that, you know, this thirty dollar Amazon fan just bomb is blasting him with heat. Mm-hmm. He's gonna have to start taking off some clothes here pretty soon. I know, pretty soon. That's not that's not that kind of show. Yet. Oh. Okay. What's the cat going to do, huh? That's the after show. Now, if you need to save $2, you can get the three-bladed version. But I, yeah, I, I get it. No, it's not worth it. The six-bladed yeah. version for just Yeah. Yeah. The- but anyway, uh, it, it's, it's, I, I remember my first healthier unit back in the uh, K6 days. It had the <laughs> almost exact same pad and the two wires coming out of it. So instead of applying current to it, uh, the, the the transfer of heat induces current. So it's kind of fun stuff. Yeah. And Jeremy, uh, you have a pick as well. Uh, it has. There's no link. So I, I no, can't there isn't anything. because I can't find a way to find out how much I paid for the thing back in oh. like 2010. But no, I was just recently screwing around with my Threadripper system uh, because I realized. Yeah, it's still on Windows 10. I should move it to 11, and I don't want to do an in-place upgrade. And besides, I've got an NVMe drive sitting in an external, and I should probably pop it in there because it's Threadripper. It has more than enough PCIe lanes to handle as many drives as I want to throw in there. And I realized there was something in there I had totally forgotten about. A one terabyte Western Digital Black caviar 7200 rpm which has probably been chugging uh study at home folding at home various boink projects for well over 10 years and hasn't burped once mm-hmm. so i just a little mm-hmm. respect for this damn thing which did you, you know, shut I'm it off never going to use i'm going to throw it in a corner somewhere and use it as a paperweight or something but I'm sorry, well over 10 years without a single problem, chewing data constantly, constantly uploading and downloading and moving data. I cannot complain. I'm sure it cost me a couple of hundred bucks back in the day. Yeah. Because, I mean, one terabyte in 2010 or so was, you know, it wasn't cheap. But, hey, I think I got my money's worth out of this thing. I think the warranty's expired, though. Oh, wow. <laughs> but you can buy a refurbished one at disc tag. Ancient technology. 33 bucks. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't buy it nowadays unless you're a masochist. Hmm. Or some if you're into retro hardware, hardware and need a okay, there's that. spinning hard drive for some reason. But hey, there's kids these days that would look at this and wonder what the heck it is and why is grandpa's that a save leaving icon? it around. They, they won't know. Yeah, they won't even. People don't even know what that is. Maybe Brett. harvest the magnets. Hmm. Brett, well, pick. two two things came together. Um, we had a little Prime Day going on with Amazon. I, like it's like small Prime or subprime. Ooh, maybe too much. But Prime Days are going on with Amazon right now, and uh, I had a a, uh, a mess to clean up, uh, so it needed to be vacuumed, and I mm. got out the. I got out the small vacuum cleaner, the very small portable wet dry vac, cleaned it up and did a fantastic job. This thing has been useful for so many years. I have the previous version of this thing. This thing totally sucks. It's the Bissell Little Green multi-purpose portable wet dry vac. Take it everywhere. Take it to the car, take it to the stairs, take it to the couch, wherever you have a it's mess. It's really well named. It, it exists. It, it totally is. It's definitely green. Thing, this thing really does suck. It's so good. Um, hmm. It's it it with the okay. combination of the that is not old... its intended purpose, Brett. Yeah, and yeah, you shouldn't is, be doing actually... that. Oh, we're talking about different things. Um, I'm talking about cleaning up spills and messes on couches and and uh, stairways and car. I wonder what I, I'm just curious, and I I don't actually want to know. But I am curious no. about Don't this mess. Yeah. And about. Like, I had a little mess to clean up, and the one room you didn't mention, I think, was the bathroom. And you know, sometimes you know what? It was, it was a couch cushion. It was a couch oh, cushion. Oh, okay. 
Well, hey, you know what? Who hasn't who hasn't gotten drunk and peed all over their own couch? Am I right? That's so that is not that is you know, besides that, besides the fact that you may have a point, that's not what happened. <laughs> okay. Anyway, for eighty one bucks, this thing is a is a steal for what it's capable of doing. I uh, recommend people take advantage of the Prime Day deals that are going on, especially if you need a vacuum for cleaning up after whatever might happen in the car or with a pet uh, yeah, or I, uh, somebody spilling a drink on a couch. Somebody when I had two puppies, on I, had one of, I had a similar age? thing from Bissell, and it was great. But after a while, I realized that as much as you can clean the carpet, you can't really clean the, the uh, pad under the carpet. Ooh, and yeah. after getting them finally trained, uh, there was still a smell in the house. I ended up ripping up all the carpet and padding and throwing it all away. So, but it made the floor look better before I finally made that choice. Mm-hmm. Sorry, what were we talking about? I I was talking about getting. Ch- uh, no, never mind. Never mind. But it just does get some amazing uh, stains out of uh, carpet. That's it's, good. It's amazing. Hmm. Recommended for that. Yeah, you know, I, I like picks like that. Just household Personal items. Opinion. Yeah. It's good to know that there's a good uh, solution out there for people who. What's the word? Have you been soaked carpets? Uh, <laughs> you know what? That's not what I said, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kent, your pick. So as uh, most of our viewers know, our regular viewers anyway, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and we were hit really hard by Hurricane Helene. Um, I've lived in Western North Carolina my entire life. That's 55 plus years now, and I've never seen anything like this. Um, My wife and I were extremely lucky Um, we suffered really only very, very minor damage in, in our home, just one leak on the roof. We were without power for about a week. Um, but that's, that's really all that affected us. All of our friends are safe, but many of our friends and coworkers actually lost people, uh, during this, um, there were, there are thousands of people who lost their homes there are townships here that actually just don't exist anymore. Um, I've got a friend who lives in a small town called Girton nearby that um, he can't get out, basically. All the roads that lead to any of the more major towns from where he lives are gone. The roads are gone. Um, so... My pick this week, if you have the ability to do so, um, there is a a fund that Governor Roy Cooper has set up to help for hurricane recovery. Um, uh, The mental health facility I work for is actually currently functioning as a supply warehouse for uh, supplies that come in for us to distribute them to uh, a lot of the community in need right now. so if you have the ability to help, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, but there's a lot of media going around about the, this event, um, and a lot of it's not true. Uh, and I wanted to address some of that a little bit. Uh, first off, FEMA and the National Guard were here within 24 hours after it happened, uh, distributing supplies, water, water. Um, uh, there's still uh, there's still about 80 percent of the city of Asheville that does not have water, which is, you know, about 75,000 people without water in their homes. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of things that w- uh, people here need, and um, but we're very grateful for any help you can give us. Thank you. Yep. I want to thank you for watching, listening to this podcast. We will be back again next week with more exciting content in the PC hardware enthusiast space. Until then, good night.